Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. If you remember your mythology, and I had to review it myself, but Echo and Narcissus are introduced together. Echo was a young maiden, a divine maiden, who loved Narcissus. Echo also had a problem. She talked too much. And one day she was penalized by a greater goddess. And um, uh, her talking problem, uh, she always would get the last word. She always would say the last word. And uh, she was... uh, the, p- the penalty for her much talking was um, that she could not introduce a conversation. She could only end a conversation. She would always have the last word. And uh, so one day it, while Narcissus was in the field, he hollered for someone and he said, uh, are you here? And she responded, here. And he said, come. She said, come. And of course, um, um, she would always respond because she, that's how the name Echo came to be. But when she did come and put her arms around him, he didn't want her to because uh, he was, um, well, later the story tells that um, he resisted all those that loved him. One day he resisted a young maiden and it was an echo, but it was another. And she, she prayed that, that he would have the experience of love and yet have the awful pain of it not being returned. So the prayer was granted. And uh, one day he was uh, looking into a water, a pool, that was uh, not, it was a pool that was separated, covered, the rocks were high around it, so the sun didn't reflect. And uh, none of the cattle or the wild beasts drank there. It was a very closely guarded pool, and he came to get him a fresh drink of water after he'd been chasing and hunting. He was hot and sweaty. And he looked into the water, and there he saw one of the most beautiful creatures he had ever seen. And he was so fair that uh, the story tells us that his locks were like uh, Bacchus or Apollo. And as he looked into the water, he fell in love with himself. He didn't know it was himself. But he, he was so beautiful. There have been men, you know, that are so beautiful. But we know what we look like because we have mirrors. They didn't have mirrors. And as he looked into the water, he fell in love with himself. And he loved himself so much when he reached to, to love him, to love this person that he saw. And when he did, of course, the water was disturbed and the, uh, the, the person went away. And then but as he waited, then the person came back. And he loved the person so much. And it's a very story of torment as he would reach and try for this, what he thought was a goddess in the water, and she would disappear. And so he had this pain of, of loving someone who would not return because as he reached for them, the person would always, always disappear. That's roughly speaking the story of Narcissus. The story of Narcissus is the story of being in love with oneself and not knowing it. Paul said that the problem, the, the, the narcissistic problem would be the problem, the great problem of the last days. Paul acts, actually introduces the problem in the first chapter of Romans. For he said that men would know God, but would not regard him, nor would they be thankful. They would not acknowledge him and they would not be thankful because they were lovers of themselves. And then it tells the consequence of that kind of love. That kind of love 
uh, causes God to release a man until he becomes a reprobate, and then awful things happen. Awful perversions, awful thing happen. But Paul spoke of this with a greater definition, more definitively, in 2 Timothy 3. This is the problem of Narcissus, and this is the problem that is upon us. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and are led captive, silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts. And number seven is very descriptive. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do those also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the, the faith. It's quite a description, isn't it? These are people with the narcissistic complex. And principally, they are people who love their own selves. And they love their own selves enough to want to be saved, so they have a form of godliness. But there's also something else that, that is very characteristic of their life that I think stands out, is that they are ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of truth. Now, we, we can quickly think of, um, of society, the tremendous knowledge that's in society. Uh, we can think of the tremendous education that has come to uh, civilization as a whole. And we can say, yes, we are a society that's a great learning society, but we've never really come to the knowledge of truth. But, but I see this as... Uh, primarily a religious problem because uh, so society or civilization as a whole is not really a godly civilization, nor does she claim to be. These people are religious people, but a people who love themselves and a people who are learning and never coming to a knowledge of truth and also a people who resist authority. They resist spiritual authority. Now, these are characteristics that I see that are nar narcissistic, that are all involved in loving ourselves. The household of Narcissus was such a household because the house of Narcissus characterizes all households that have been here since Adam and Eve. This is also characteristic of our own households unless we have the prescription that Paul has given us in Romans 8, unless we really have faith in God. And that faith is a greater faith than one of right, one of ritual, and one of religious observance which is everywhere, that faith is one that is faith, a faith that is characterized by rejection in society itself. A faith that is characterized not just by right, religious observance and ritual, but that faith is the faith that is characterized by suffering. He said, we are joint heirs in Romans 8 if we suffer. All that are godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer. And unless we have a faith that's characterized by more than right, ritual, and religious observance, unless we are in our own households and in, and in the household of faith rejected, we do not have the biblical sign of true religion. Whenever 
Whenever we embrace Jesus and whenever we're willing to follow him completely, we will be rid of the narcissistic complex, of the narcissistic mind bent, which really is a description of Adam and Eve and all households ever since. The, 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 uh, the Greek thinkers somehow had to think up of a story uh, as to how this came to pass. They thought of the story of Echo, how the, and they told of the, of the goddess Echo, the nymph, uh, and they told the story of Narcissus, but they were trying to explain a reality. And they were explaining what it's like to love and the pain of that rejection. And, and they explained it. And they explained also, this story is also a story of justice because what happened was so many loved him and he loved no one and finally only loved himself. Loved himself and did not know it. The lovers of themselves do not know that they love themselves. They do not know that they are sinner most in their life. That's a narcissistic complex. Narcissus didn't know that he was in love with himself, but he was. And religious people that are primarily self-assertive who are in love with themselves really do not know that. You and I don't embrace evil consciously. We have to deceive ourselves in order to embrace this kind of thing. And it begins very early in our Christian life. It begins very early in our life, if you please. In fact, I think the voice of God comes and uh, we make a decision to be religious, but we make us a decision to reserve the right to run our own life. And when we do, we become a lover of self rather than a lover of God. Now, now, the alternative, you have two alternatives if you're not going to love self. You can love others, you can be altruistic, or you, can, or you can love God. I'm talking about where things are primarily centered. Now, altruistic religion, loving others, so to speak, centering your life in, in others can be as deceiving as loving yourself. See? America is altruistic. The churches of America are altruistic. Uh, one symbol of our altruism is the, is the fact that our rock stars have gotten together and other stars and have made a record for the people of Ethiopia. Well, listen, we're not totally bad in this nation. But, uh, but, it's, but it's not being lost in others being lost in others will not bring salvation. The only way I know that we can have a proper view of ourselves and, a pro and relate properly to others is to be in love with God himself. For the knowledge of the holy is understanding. We understand our own lost condition we understand, and in understanding our own lost condition, we recognize that right ritual and religious observance will not save us. That there's got to be something more, and so we fling ourselves completely in God's hands, and in faith we trust and we obey. And we leave, we leave the uh, plan of salvation up to Him. You see, because if we institute our own religious observance, we feel religious and we feel saved and we're not saved at all. Now see, that's the problem in Romans, that's the problems in Romans 1 through 8. Paul is saying, even in the first chapter, here is the problem. Men know that God is real, but they will not acknowledge him and they're, unth they're, they're unthankful. So something bad happens to them. But then he goes on and he describes an, a second set of people. These people are moral. And then he said, these people are religious speaking about those that keep the law. But he said, salvation is in none of it. They're just as lost as the man who 
never had a form of godliness. Then he gives us Abraham in chapter 4. And he said, Abraham had neither right nor religious observance at first, but yet was justified before God. How did he do that? Because he had a relationship with God. He trusted God and denied himself. And he trusted God as to how his salvation was going to be. He said he had faith in God. It was accounted unto him in righteousness. And Paul says, basically, that's the way that every man is saved. Now, when you trust God, God will require you to deny yourself. God will require you, will require that self be crucified because self is very tied up in selfishness and self is very tied up in the very things that will bring death to himself and to all mankind. You see? So what did he say? Abraham, leave your country and go out where you have to depend upon me, leaning on the everlasting arms. And God may not require us to leave this place. You may have been a native here all your life, but with my life, he required for me to leave the, the birthplace, you see. My experience was involved, my salvation was involved in getting to another location. You may not be required to do that, but he, he requires each one of us to leave the place where we are if we're going to be saved. We've got to turn loose. We've got to lose our life on the home front. Now, the characteristic sign will be, will be persecution. So he says in Romans 7, we will be, or 8, we will be joint heirs if we suffer. <laughs> and I'm telling you, the world is very happy for you to have a religion. And the religious world is very happy for you to have a form of godliness. But do not have faith in God. Do not wait on God. Do not wait and trust and obey and then start walking with him. If you do, there will be a great something set up against your life and you'll be separated from professing brethren. Now, this is the sign. I don't know how. You see, it can't be the sign of religious observance. Paul said that's not enough. So he takes us on into Romans 8 and he said, but now here is a sign. It's the sign of suffering. But he says, be encouraged because that which is coming against you has been harnessed for your good. So he says, and Romans, we know, thank God they knew because suffering had already started severely there and was going to be, was going to be martyrdom for many of them in just a, few, uh, just a few years. And he said, and we know that all things work together for good that it's all working for our benefit. It's working for our sanctification. It's working for our salvation. But it's working for something more important than that. Adversity. It is a positive sign, not a negative sign. I fight every day and every week to, to have health enough to get on my feet. It isn't a, it isn't a bad sign. It's a good sign. <laughs> the sign of adversity. He, it, it, and, and Job had the sign of adversity until he lost 10 children, lost all his camels and lost everything else. See, boy, I tell you, what a revelation he had. What a revelation he had. <laughs> with, it, with sores on his body, he said, I know my Redeemer lives. And he went on to say something that indicated that he knew that his body would be resurrected by the Redeemer. That's a tremendous thing. Tremendous thing. My great problem in my ministry is to get people out of the narcissistic complex. And he said, this is the way it was going to be in the last days. And he said, these kind of people be covetous. How, how do you get people to, to, to get so liber, liberated that what you have to do is pray for balance instead of having to constantly remind them that the tithe belongs to God? You shouldn't have to do that at all. How, how are you going to do... Uh, you, you can see the certain signs that tell us that we're, we're not really, we're just simply professors. And we have a good feeling. It, it was a great thing to hear Amazing Grace a while ago, but it's, it's greater if that grace has, has gone on to work in your life so that you are really looking like Jesus, that you're really doing his will. There's a, there's a good feeling and a good spirit most all the time in this place, but I think that provides a greater danger. Because here's a place where men can meet God. Here's a place where immediacy is practiced. Here's a place where we can practice the very presence of God. We don't think that he's somewhere behind a veil. 
of right, religious observance and ritual, we think that we're speaking to him directly in our hearts because the blood has been shed. See, it's a great thing. It's also a good place to, it's a good place to go to hell. I don't think it's a good place, it's a bad place, but I mean, it's an easy place to do it because of the narcissistic complex. Because we never really get out of the, now we don't have to, uh, unless we're twisted, we don't have to learn how to love ourselves. We already do. That's one thing we have when we, when we make it into this life. <laughs> and uh, we, have a, we have a love, a love for ourselves. And but what God wants us to do is to love each other as much as we love ourselves. In fact, it gets a little higher than that in the writings of Paul for he says, esteem others more highly than yourselves. You see. And uh, it, takes, it takes the work of sanctification. He said these problems and, and, and the, these groanings, these sufferings are working to get rid of this narcissistic complex. And uh, I think it happens at salvation. I think that when a person is converted, he, he begins an experience right there where, he, where he's as interested in the other man as he is himself. I think about every person that finds salvation is immediately interested in somebody else being saved. He wants everybody to have what he's got. And it's only if he's still born. And I want to argue whether eternity's involved there or not. But I'm saying there are people who experience that forgiveness of God, but, but they have that good feeling. And then God calls upon them with seconds or minutes to, to, to witness and they don't do it. Now, that's a selfish act. God's trying, to, God's trying to feed lambs round about. It's a selfish act. And when you return, that, to return to that, you return to a love of yourself. You return to a narcissistic complex. Now, you don't know it, but that's what's taking place. You would, in all honesty, if you could examine yourself honestly, you would see what you've done. But it's not really a highly conscious, uh, a high thing as far as focus is concerned. See what I mean? And he's merciful and he calls upon us then to go home and pull out the checkbook for the next Sunday and write out the tithes. And a, and a new convert, if he doesn't do it, he's disobeyed twice. And then he calls upon us to witness Calls upon us to pray for a loved one. You see, and then that disobedient pattern returns over and over again. What's he doing? He's, he's got himself a form of godliness now. He, he felt revival in his soul. He felt the touch of God, but instead of denying himself, see, and that thing is constant. Instead of getting into the habit of denying himself so God could then conform him to them. You're not conformed to the image at, at conversion. No, that's the work of sanctification. You are a new creation. You're a new creature at that point. Don't tell me why it's so, don't ask me why it's so complex. I don't know. This is simply the facts of life. Simply know that the old man has to still be dealt with. So he gives us Romans 7. Kapoom, 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 kapoom. And Paul screams almost and said, who will deliver me from this awful wretchedness? I thank God Jesus Christ will. <laughs> So, and then, so then in Romans 8, he, he tells us more and he starts telling us to walk after the Spirit. The man that walks after the Spirit minds the things of the Spirit. He doesn't mind the things of the flesh. He enters this new world. He has this new horizon and, and, he, and he starts obeying God and he's not obeying God perfectly. But I want to tell you something. Well, I want to tell you a little something. You may not have a full revelation of everything you're supposed to do, but I want you to know if you're hungry for God, he'll have you in the right place at the right time, saying the right things to the right person, and he'll have you there providentially. There will be a time as you come to full sonship that you'll be led by the Spirit to do all these things, but if you will not return to the narcissistic life, if you will not turn, having this form of godliness, see it said, but it denies the power. The reason it denies the power is because self takes back over. See, but God has to be in focus. We have to be listening to him. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If you will obey God, if you want from the time of your conversion, if you will read that Bible and pray and witness and you and you'll trust God, I want you to know, I want you to know something. He will lead you. He lead every person that does it. We get ourselves into the into the hard-hearted state by disobedience and by and by disobedience as quickly See, now, Charles was so wonderful. Sunday, he got himself a fresh start. And he just, he just a newborn. So if he stumbles around, 
<laughs> That's all right. But boy, the real sign of a believer is that he gets up and goes again. The real sign of a transformed man is he gets up and what is he doing? He's being transformed in the process. He said, I got something in my heart and it's not supposed to be there and I know it. I thought it was great that he did that. But that was a sign of a Christian. It was great. He was even in the confession. And then in our response, he, he was being sanctified. He was being conformed to the image of Christ right there. And he said, all these things work together. That's a negative thing that hit him. But it said it works together for good to them that love God, to them that are the call according to his purpose. And he said, God saw us in his foreknowledge. And he, he knew us a long time ago. He predestinated us. And then he called us and he justified us and he glorified us. There's the pattern right there. But just before that, he said he, he, called, he predestinated us to become conformed to the image of his son, to the icon of his son, to be just like Jesus Christ, who never had his way one time while he walked this earth. You and I don't know what Jesus is like. We only know what God's like. Because Jesus denied himself. We really don't know what the Jesus man is like. And yet we do. Something, isn't it? But we really have a view of God. That's why Jesus is, Jesus is the perfect revelation of God. He never once... He never once did what he wanted to do. He said, I always do the will of my father. His brother said, well, go down and show yourself. He said, my time has not come. It's not God's will for me to do it. Seems like a good thing to do, but it is not God's will for me to do it. Well, the wonderful thing about this, you know, I've had a wonderful time. God's really helped me to talk to you tonight. When Paul greeted these saints, he said, greet them that be of the household of Narcissus. I want you to know that the narcissistic complex is more subtle than the Herodian complex. It's easier for a Herodian to be saved than it is for a narcissistic person to be saved. Because a Herodian person is downright mean. And he knows it. So looking back over his greetings to the household of Aristobulus and particularly to Herodias, to, to Herodian, that type of personality, that pronounced meanness in a person's life, it's even easier to capture that person. He said the harlots and the publicans will go into the kingdom before you. Why? Before you. Who? You that are followers of Narcissus. You love yourselves, but you're so downright religious, you don't know you're following your own self. You've got right, you've got ritual, you've got religious observance, but you're not denying yourself. You've not obeyed God. Narcissus, the, 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 the complex of narcissism is all over nominal Christianity. It's everywhere. We come and we feel a little good, but we disobey him when we go out the door. We disobey him. We disobey him in the audience itself. If we have free church worship, we'll speak when we're not supposed to. And if we have free church worship, we won't speak when we're supposed to. That's lovers of self. Sit there and ride the backbone of the service and suck up all the good feeling we can when God's told us to do something and in between we're not prepared, not obeying God on Saturday, that's, a, that's, that's the complex of Narcissus. And the man that doesn't obey God on Saturday cannot hear God on Sunday. There it is right there. Oh, it's the truth. Oh, it's the truth. How many of you have been called to pray on Saturday night? Well, we're not, we've not made much out of this. But I can't believe that the number will always stay from 12 to 18. How many earn, earnestly, uh, if you haven't joined the men here on 7 and 8 at night, and listen, we don't need anybody to come with extra burdens. We don't need anybody to come, I, you don't need anybody to come with extra prayer requests. It's the hardest thing in the world for a spirit. Uh, prayer meeting is hard on me. Because if you're not there and you're not clear with God and you're not there, come to carry the burden. You'll come carrying a burden and what, what the spiritual leader has to do is to jack you up down-faced and dark-eyed and, and there just because you've uh, been prodded. That's no, we don't need it. Forget it. What we need is pure prayer warriors here. We need warriors, but, but my question is, why haven't you been called? Why haven't you been called? And that's just one example that comes to my mind. 
There are many, many other things that God's made away. My, we've got the easiest time around here you ever did see. This preacher doesn't put you through the meal every night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. He leaves it up to you to choose a couple of nights a week, a couple of nights a week to get out and visit the saints and get out and visit the lost. He leaves it up to you. And yet week after week after week after week, you won't do it. There's a church up the road that doesn't give you as much freedom as I do, but I'm called to give you freedom. There's great danger in it. I make sure I make sure the church is dark on Monday night. I make sure that the ministers have at least two nights at home. And we get we let it we let it contribute to our own self life. Take advantage of it. Take advantage of the freedom that God's given us. Instead of waiting and tearing before God till God burns a hole in our soul until He speaks us to definitely about somebody. And I don't care if you wait and wait and wait at home and home and home until God burns your soul, but wait until he does. See, it's a tremendous thing. We're not prodded much around here. We're not forced. But you know what? I'm convinced that in forcing people through programs, you don't really have them at all. You keep them on a high through a program. Now, we took a natural tumble. Right after, eight, right after Dr. Trueblood was here, and I told the fellow, I said, there'll be a natural tumble, but I said, there's also some hungry hearted saints that will continue on with us. And I'm looking for those right there. I'm praying the Lord will add to the church daily such as being saved, and he will add those that are willing to be, to be all for God, those that are willing to suffer for God, those that are willing to rid themselves of this narcissistic complex. This is an easy place to go to church, but it also is the most difficult if you know what's going on if you know to give yourselves unto God. That is, it it is a place of the cross. It's really up to you. Really up to any one of you. And God's helping me to make it clear in the sermon here. The The persons who were in the household of Narcissus were not guilty of the Narcissistic complex because he said, greet them that be of the household of Narcissus which are in the Lord. And that made all the difference right there. They were in the Lord. They were under the Lordship of Christ. Those were men and women. Those were men and women that whenever the leisure time came, they were praying about where to go. And you know where they went? When Paul was in prison, now they were down at Paul's house. And they were out in different places and they were in just in doing God's will. The best, and they were slaves. They were busy most of the time. But what little leisure they had, they were crying out about what God wanted them to do. And there was a lot of unkept yards and there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of clothing that didn't get done up by those slaves. But I want you to know something. It got the attention of God. So that before Paul ever got there, before he ever got there, he was saying to those who are of the household of Narcissus, I greet you as saints in the Lord. You don't have the complex. You're in the Lord. Praise God for you. It was easier to be lost in Narcissus' household than it was Herodian's household. But these persons were not lost. These persons were persons whose faith was known around the world. That means their obedience, their work for God was known around the world. And in the back, he says, in the the front, he says, their faith in the back, in the 16th chapter, he says, your obedience is known around the world. I mean, they were obedient people. And insofar as they had the freedom to make a choice, they made a choice for God. And God told them what to do. And it, it got all over the world what they were doing. Now, they were ones who understood Paul when he came in. He wrote this letter without change. But when he came in, he came with, with, with change. They were ones who didn't misunderstand the man of God. They saw that when he came in, he came in triumphantly. They saw that when he came in, he came in in victory. They saw that here was a man. They knew him by his chains. It made sense to them. But they also knew that in his heart, he was a liberated man. You know where Saul and Ninson found God? You know where Saul and Ninson found out about freedom? He found it out in, in commun- the archipelagal, or what do you call it? The, yeah, the um, gulags. He found it in the gulags. He found it in, in communist prisons. And it was there that he was liberated. It's there that he learned about, about freedom. It's there that he got contentment in his soul. It was there that he found that where the Spirit of the Lord is, he had liberty. It's a tremendous thing. 
Dostoevsky was the same way. He found, he found God in the prison of the czars. And once a man is free in his soul like that and gives himself in utter faith to God, he's no longer guilty of the narcissistic complex. He's no longer in love with himself. Only so far as he loves God and knows to value his own person. And, there, and that's also in relation to his brothers and sisters. These were quite a group here, probably slaves. But Paul gives them a commendation that is tremendous. And it's a commendation given of the Lord. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. One other thing. These people were not nearly as educated as you. These people were not nearly as cultured as you. These people had not heard. They never had a New Testament. It was being written. Most of them had never seen an Old Testament. They just heard it read and preached about it. They couldn't afford it. But I want to tell you something. It was to these people that he wrote the book of Romans and wrote the book of Romans to them and expected them to understand. And they did. Because they were taught by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that something? Isn't it great? I want to thank the Lord for the phone calls that have been coming in. Got one last night, and I'm telling you, there was a man who heard my tape on the Fellowship of Knowing, and I want you to know he cried. God broke his heart. The wife called me and said, I tell you, Brother Oliver, God really helped you. And then another, then it was another call that got through to me. and uh, was a call uh, telling me about uh, the tape on Easter Sunday where I preached uh, uh, on... Uh, uh, I forgot what the name of it was, but it was on, oh, we have not followed cunningly devised myths, fables, and how that the proof came at the Mount of Transfiguration. I, I want to thank God. I don't know what in the world. And I got a letter from uh, Betty Young in Ohio and uh, the, tape of the, uh, the tape of the ordination had gotten to her and I guess she's heard it over and over and over again. I want to thank the Lord. I I'm, I'm preaching a strange gospel, but it is the gospel by God's grace. And I'm pulling hard for us to be what God wants us to be. I'm thankful that you're here tonight. And let me say this. You're the only ones that I have a chance of reaching. And myself, because I'm in it with you, trying to get to the place where God would have us. You're the only ones that I have a chance of reaching because you're dedicated enough to be here at mid midweek service. There's hardly a hope one for those that can't follow through on the services of the Lord. But there's hope for me and there's hope for you. And if you and I, if you and I break through to absolute faith, let me tell you something. It will, it will consume the ones on Sunday morning and the ones around about. It'll consume a whole lot more if you and I break through. And I believe we're breaking through. I just have to keep on preaching like this and tell you what I see in these various things. This was quite a church at Rome and we're learning more about it through the words of Paul tonight where he says, greet those that are of the household of Narcissus which are in the Lord. And that's the key there. Oh, may God help me and you to be in the Lord. Help us, Lord, this night we pray to be in you. Help us, Lord, in uh, the next hours, the next days, and on Saturday especially. My uh, mentioning the prayer meeting was not to rally uh, car carnal people into a time of prayer on Saturday night. That wasn't it at all. But it was an illustration, and it was a call, because I believe that our ranks should be swelling. The ranks of the dedicated should be swelling. And so as a pastor, I have a right to call attention to the fact that if it's not, what we have is what mankind's had for for hundreds of years, we simply have the, narciss the Narcissus complex. And it is that we love ourselves and uh, we have a form of godliness, but we're denying the power of it. We're denying the power. The power of God's not going out. Oh Lord, break those bonds, we pray. And thank you that on a mid in a midweek service of glory, because the, the choir sang in glory, the hymns were, were sung in glory. Uh, Lord, it's been a precious time here tonight, I pray that we will be willing, O oh Lord, to step out of this place and to really obey Thee. Help us, Lord. Could be tonight the revelation has come.
I would thank thee and praise thee if it were true for more than one of us in this place tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.